Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us here. And I hope you really do get something from this at the end of the day. So the plan today is for me to talk to you about um, hypothyroidism, both from my perspective, because I am a hypothyroid patient. I don't actually have a thyroid at all because I had a complete thyroidectomy back in 2003 or thereabouts. And also as a doctor, as a doctor that sat on the NICE committee, which was a very, very frustrating time for me, and I would explain why. Um, and as a doctor treating patients, obviously day to day in my practice. Okay, let's get going then. Uh, now, can I change that? Yes, there we are. So just a little bit about me, which Lorraine has already talked to you about anyway. I am an NHS GP, I work in North London. I did do some private GP, but I'm actually not really doing private GP now at all because I just don't have time. Because amongst the other things I do, I also have a 20 month old who was a little late surprise in life. Um, I, as I said, sat on the nice um, thyroid disease guideline and I will talk about that quite a lot. I'm the BBC um, radio resident GP. So we do shows regularly there and thyroid comes up an awful lot. I blog for the big GP magazine Pulse. Um, and as I said, I lost my thyroid about 16 years ago, although I actually think it's more than that, because if I was 33, it was actually 20 years ago. OK, so a quick run through. I am going to talk about what the thyroid is, but most of you know this because that's why you're here. So I'm not going to dwell on all of this and the symptoms and the signs. I'm going to try and focus on management if I can. But obviously, I'll be guided by you and your questions afterwards if you want to recap on anything. So the question that I get asked most often are things like, why is my GP happy with my normal blood test when I've got all of the signs of thyroid disease? So we'll talk about that. Um, why are GPs just not that aware of thyroid issues and how can they be made more aware? What train is, is place? Why is there such a long wait for um, consultants to actually see people? And why does the thyroid, when it goes wrong, affect everything? Why does your system just break down? Um, and we'll talk about all of those things. Okay, <laughs> right. So as a GP, I see a mix of patients, those who specifically come to me to ask about thyroid symptoms, most often weight and tiredness, those with other symptoms where I as a GP suspect that there might be thyroid involvement, and those who have got existing hypothyroidism who need management. And I think that's possibly one of the groups of patients that lose out massively because they're kind of discarded once GPs think that they're fine because that's what the blood results are telling them. There is a temptation not to even see them to just look at the blood results. So we'll talk about that. So obviously not teaching anyone to suck eggs. eggs. The thyroid feedback system, the negative feedback system looks quite simple, but it's actually much more complicated than this particular diagram shows because there are lots of other influences as well from adrenaline through to female hormones. Um, and so it's impossible for me to talk about that today. Um, but in a nutshell, your, um, your pituitary gland is in control of how much thyroid your body makes and it produces a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH, which is the one that GPs and other doctors tend to put lots and lots of store by. This tells the thyroid gland how much thyroxine or T4, which is the inactive part of thyroxine um, in the main to produce. So if your body has lots of T4 and T3, which is the active one, it will feed back to the pituitary gland, saying there's lots of us around. So your pituitary gland will reduce the amount of TSH that it produces to slow things down and vice versa if you don't have enough. It sounds pretty simple. It's not quite that simple, but the TSH is basically the accelerator or the knot. So you just, the, the foot is being lifted on and off of that all of the time to tell the body how much hormone to make. But in the main, we, we make 80% of um, T4, which is the pro-hormone, and that gets converted at the tissues all over the body and just about every organ into T3, which is the active hormone that really does all of the hard work. So how do patients present to me? Well, they feel poo basically and you know I think I had to do this because this is how I felt when things were not working for me I just felt poo everything just felt wrong I I just didn't feel right and there's no other way of describing it I think unless you've actually experienced it and for me as a doctor that's probably the most frustrating thing because when I hear other doctors wittering on about how easy it is to treat thyroid disease I know that they've never had a problem with their thyroid disease. 
And it's true that for some people, it's really easy to treat. And they take T4 for their entire life. They never change their dose and they always feel fine. But for some of us, that isn't the case. And things are very, very difficult to actually get right. And it certainly was the case for me. So what are the symptoms of being hypothyroidism? Hypothyroid, sorry. So there are, again, a myriad of these, and they also cross over with many, many other disease processes. And this was one of the problems that we had on the NICE committee, because I wanted to put into the NICE guidelines some of the symptoms so that people could sit and look at a list and think, oh, wow, actually, I do have that collection of symptoms. But the consensus in the room was that there were so many different symptoms and they cross over with so many other um, disease processes. For example, women who are going through menopause often have very, very similar symptoms to those who have thyroid disease, just to name one. That the committee decided that it wouldn't be right to list all of these um, symptoms because on their own, they weren't specific enough. But you're looking at people who, whose mood changes, and I think mood change is a big thing that often is not assigned to thyroid disease. They're tired, they're cold, they're gaining weight, they're not eating because they're not hungry, they're constipated, their periods have changed. So for a woman, this can often be one of the first signs of thyroid disease. So if you're hypothyroid, your periods come closer together and they get really, really heavy. And if you're hyper, they move further apart and they're really light. You can get dry and scaly skin, brittle nails, loss of libido, and so on. So the list is really endless. And as you can see, it's a multi-organ disease. It just about affects everything from your brain down to the, the muscles and your, your fingernails and your toenails. It affects everything. So testing for thyroid disease, what does NICE say? So this is reasonably complex because there's lots of different scenarios about when you should use what test, why and how. And there was lots and lots of debate about this in the committee. So NICE says that you should consider tests for thyroid dysfunction if there is a clinical suspicion of thyroid disease, but that one symptom alone may, may not be indicative of thyroid disease, which is what I was saying. And this is why they didn't want to put symptoms into the, the um, guideline. So we should be offering tests for thyroid dysfunction if somebody has type 1 diabetes, because that's an autoimmune disease. And if you have that, you're prone to other autoimmune diseases like thyroid disease. If somebody has new onset atrial fibrillation, and the reason for that is that we know that hyperthyroidism can actually cause arrhythmias. And you should consider tests for thyroid dysfunction in depression or unexplained anxiety. And I must confess, as a GP, my workload when it comes to depression is massive. It's probably 20 to 25% of every, patient, every session that I do as a GP. And thyroid testing does not come high on my list of that. So I do think about that more now because we talked about it at length. And I was told some stories, I think by Lorraine recently, about patients who have had severe mental illness and it turned out they actually had thyroid dysfunction. That's right. So when should we, what test should we do? And you know, how should we do them? Just bear with me, sorry, one second, I just need to. Oops, I've gone the wrong way again, haven't I? Right, sorry guys. Okay, so what tests should we do at GP level? So we should me consider measuring thyroid simulating hormone, TSH, on its own when secondary thyroid dysfunction, so pituitary di disease, is not suspected. So if we suspect that the problem that's causing the hypothyroidism or hyper is coming from the thyroid gland itself rather than the pituitary gland, we should measure TSH. And then if the TSH is out of range, we should then measure T4. If the TSH is below the reference range, we should measure T3 and T4. So you can see there are lots of different rules that are very difficult to you know, remember for GPs. They'd have to look this up a lot of the time. Um, and also, it depends whether we're thinking about hypothyroidism or hyper. So as we're talking about hypo today, the NICE guidelines say that if the TSH is high, which is indicating hypothyroidism, then we should just measure T4. We'll come back to that because it's controversial as we know. Not for me it isn't, but for many people. 
We should consider measuring both TSH and T4 when secondary thyroid dysfunction is suspected. If the TSH is low, um, then measure 3T3 and consider repeating these tests for thyroid dysfunction. If the symptoms worsen or if new symptoms develop, but no sooner than six weeks, because it's generally considered that it takes about six weeks to see any dramatic change in thyroid function if you make a change. Cascading, this wonderful word, which was banded about in the NICE Guidance Committee day in, day out. And basically cascading is a way of saving money. So you start with the minimal amount of tests that you can, i.e. a TSH, and only then if that is out of range, should that trigger the next test. Now the problem I have with that as a doctor and as a patient is the TSH is often in range, but that doesn't mean the patient is well. And we know that. So we'll talk about that more just now. But I have a problem with cascading because the only reason for cascading is saving money. Um, don't let anybody else tell you anything else. Um, I think as a GP, we should always be looking at TSH and T4 and if possible, T3, but it quite often isn't possible because labs just won't do it. But what does it all mean? Well, you know that it's, if the TSH is above the reference range, then we suspect hypothyroidism. And if the T4 is below reference range, we have hypothyroidism. Subclinical hypothyroidism is when the TSH is, rain, is raised, but the T4 is within um, reference range. And we'll talk about how that should be approached and treated because lots of people sit in that area for a long time. So hopefully, having had all of those bloods and having got a GP who actually knows what they mean, and is handling them properly and has done their cascading appropriately, you, should, you have a diagnosis and you should be happy. Well, yes, certainly you should be happy, but it doesn't always end there as we know. So what do we do now? If we've got a patient in front of us, or if it's me as a patient who has a low T4 and a raised TSH, they have hypothyroidism for sure. That's the diagnostic criteria. So we should think about other tests. You know, should we make sure that there's nothing else going on? So you might want to just look for other autoimmune um, disease. You would want to, if this was the first time that this has happened, do the autoantibodies to see if we're dealing with Hashimoto's, you know, exactly what's going on. We would want to treat the patient and make a plan for ongoing management and testing because it doesn't end here, as we know, it really doesn't. If we do do the antibodies, um, which should happen, although I've been having antibodies rejected by the lab recently in my area, which is North London, which is outrageous. Um, so if you get told by your GP that you can't have antibodies, you should tell them that the NICE guidance say that they should be tested at least once when you have a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. And why? Because we want to know if it's Hashimoto's, autoimmune thyroiditis or Graves' disease. It's as simple as that. You need them to get the answers. Why is my thyroid not working? Okay, so why do we treat everybody with hypothyroidism? Why not leave them? It's really, really important. After I lost my thyroid all of those years ago, I have said many times that I'm gonna write a book one day called Look After Your Thyroid because you'll miss it when it's gone. Because who knew? what this little butterfly shaped gland was doing in my neck quietly. I didn't know. And only after it was gone, did I realize that I wanted it back. And I really, really wanted it back. So if you don't treat someone with hypothyroidism and they live for a long time in a hypothyroid state and it gets worse, they will develop a low, uh, low pitched hoarse voice. They'll get a very puffy looking face. They'll get thin or partly missing eyebrows, particularly at the ends. Their heart rate will slow. They will develop anemia. They could develop hearing loss. And ultimately, if they had no function in thyroid, so for example, me, because I have no thyroid, without thyroid hormone replacement, I would die. You know, that's not, a, you know, not in question. And actually, having been without thyroid um, hormones for a while while I was having other treatments I actually came very close to coma within about two weeks so it didn't take very long for me everybody's different but it's a really really important gland I always say to people it is your engine it's the engine of the car and without it the car does not function it doesn't drive 
This was me in 2003. Now, I'm 20 years younger than I am now. I hope I look better today. I'm a bit tired, but I hope I look better. It took about two weeks for me to look like this. And you can see I've got periorbital swelling, which for me is always the first sign that my thyroid function is too low. I start to get swelling around my eyes. I'm puffy everywhere. I look like I'm overweight, but I've never been overweight in my life, ever. My hair is looking awful. And basically, I'm feeling in that photo as bad as I look. But the other thing to note is that because it happened day by day over um, two weeks, I didn't notice it happening very much. And it was only when I saw my mum after two weeks, hadn't seen her, that she actually put her hand to her mouth and said, oh my God, what's happened to you? And this is what I think doctors don't realise. And I did write an article for Pulse magazine about T3. And I used this photo to say, do not underestimate how important thyroid hormone is. So treatments, and I'm going to whiz through them quickly now because I'd rather get to the proper questions and the dialogue about this. So T4, levothyroxine, is the first line treatment for thyroid disease. And that's fine. I'm not knocking that at all. The dosage is 1.6 micrograms per kilo on average. And for adults under 65, your doctor should start at this dose. And this is a big change, but it happened a couple of years ago and doctors have not picked up on it. And you'll find that doctors go in and start a young person under 65 on 25 micrograms when actually they need 100. And they go really slowly. So you spend another three months while they gently, gently titrate up the dose. It's nonsense. If you're under 65, they should go in with a maximum dose when they start you. And that is actually in the nice guidance. So over 65, yes, we're more careful because we have to worry about irritating the heart by going in with too big a dose. But under 65, no. So if you are newly diagnosed with um, hypothyroidism, make sure you're getting a full dose of thyroxine. And for the majority of people, this will work and it will work well. And interestingly, it actually worked well for me for about five years. And then I became um, very stressed because I had some big, big stresses going on in life and suddenly it didn't work anymore. And I'll talk about that a bit later. But this is what I mean when I said earlier about there are other hormones which interact with thyroid hormones. So for me at that time, it was cortisol and adrenaline because I was very stressed and my T4 stopped working completely. But anyway, we digress on to me. What does NICE say about other treatments? So it specifically says, do not routinely, and that's a very, very, very important word in this sentence, do not routinely offer lyothyronine, which is T3, alone or in combination with levothyroxine. And the reason I say that that routinely is important is many doctors, most doctors, most CCGs are reading that as do not offer. They are completely ignoring, they've got some blindness involved to the word routinely, they're completely ignoring that and reading that sentence as do not offer. And that is not what the guidance says from NHS England. And it is not what the, all the major charities, the BTA say. They accept that some patients do need lyothyronine. I take lyothyronine. And if a CCG is saying, no, you can't have it, you must demand a referral on to secondary care to see an endocrinologist to talk about it. There are problems inherent with that um, in that some endocrinologists are just absolutely against T3. Um, and so even seeing them is not going to help you. But push and ask to see another one. Do some research on what endocrinologists in your area are actually pro T3. The NICE guideline says do not offer natural thyroid extract. And I must confess, as a doctor, I have so little experience in this that I don't feel comfortable in that area and would always seek advice. And also, NICE says that we must offer treatments based on evidence. And there's not enough evidence, and we are unsure about long-term effects of both natural thyroid extract and lyothyronine. I don't think we are unsure about lyothyronine. And I do feel very strongly that the opposition to it is based purely on cost. And I have had 
Pharmacists working for NHS England tell me that if it were not for the cost, there would not be a debate about lyothyronine. And that did come out in the NICE guidance when I was on the committee. So treatment has started. You should go from feeling like poo to feeling like this. And in many, many cases that does happen. It's certainly the aim and it should be achievable. It doesn't always happen and that's really sad. So why not and what's happening? So doctors are told to maintain the TSH within the reference range. The reference range is huge. The reference range is, is from 0.3 to about 4.9, depending on your lab and your CCG. And that's big. We know that even with people who are not on thyroid treatment, their thyroid works fine. They feel better in questionnaires when their thyroid hormone, their, their thyroid stimulating hormone, their TSH is under 2.5. So just because your TSH is under 4.9 does not necessarily mean that you'll feel better. And this is a really, really, that's why it's in red, important sentence in the NICE guidelines. If symptoms persist, even if the TSH is within range, consider adjusting the dose of levothyroxine to achieve well-being. Don't push it outside of that. So don't use so much T4 that your TSH becomes suppressed because there are independent risks of having a suppressed TSH like um, osteoporosis and um, AF. And a low, a suppressed TSH is an independent risk factor for atrial fibrillation and nobody wants that, believe me. So your doctor will often not even have read that sentence in the NICE guidance. So they will look on the screen They'll see your TSH under 4.9 and they will say, oh, you're fine. They won't see you. They won't talk to you. They won't ask you if you feel fine and you may not be feeling fine. So it's really important if you're not feeling fine, even if your doctor says your blood tests say you're fine, to say, well, actually, no, I'm not feeling fine. And have a bigger conversation about it. Ask what your TSH is. Ask them to do a T4. See where that's sitting. It's also important to remember that a TSH can take up to six months to return to the reference range for people that have had a very high TSH. So it can actually take a long time, even if you're feeling fine. So that's fine. If, if your TSH is still above normal and you're feeling fine, that's okay. Then just carry on and watch it, test it and see. So when should we test again then? Well, if you're feeling fine, even if your TSH is high, Retest every three months until you get stabilised, until it looks like it's settled to its, its place. It's within range, hopefully. And then just do it once a year. And once a year should be fine, as long as, and this is always the important thing, as long as you're feeling fine. You know, blood tests are fine, but it is actually about you as a person, a patient, an individual. I would say always measure T4. I would always like to see a T4 because your T4 could be sitting right at the very bottom of where it needs to be. And that could be why you're not feeling well. So not that you necessarily need T3. I'm not pushing T3 on anyone. It just might mean you need a little bit more of levothyroxine. And you'll never know that if you're just testing a TSH. So just quickly about subclinical hypothyroidism. So this is when you've got TSH, which is above the range, but a normal T4. That's called subclinical hypothyroidism and doesn't necessarily need treating. If your, T4, your TSH is under 10 and you feel fine, then don't treat it. Retest it in three months and see how it is. If, however, your TSH is above 10, but your T4 um, is still normal, I would treat that because it's not going to improve usually. So that's what the NICE guidance says as well. If it's lower than 10 on two separate occasions, three months apart, then consider treatment, but only if the patient's feeling unwell with symptoms of hypothyroidism. Now, weirdly, the NICE guidance says that if there's no improvement, when you're remeasuring the TSH and it stays raised, adjust the dose, if it carries on and carries on, then disregard and, and just carry on monitoring and see what happens. So I think this is a very gray area. Um, if your TSH is between 4.9 and 10 and you've got no symptoms, that's fine, leave it alone. If it's between 4.9 and 10 and you have symptoms, then treat it. A trial of treatment is completely reasonable.
But if symptoms don't disappear, then probably disregard treatment. And I think this is one where you need a GP where you're going to have proper conversations and you, you can negotiate. You can negotiate about whether you take the T4 up a little bit or whether you disregard and see how it goes. Um, untreated, so if you've fallen into that group where you're not going to treat the subclinical hypothyroidism, the NICE guidance says retest once a year. But if it carries on, it never changes. And we do see this. We do see people that just have a TSH that sits above the normal range. And of course, we must remember that the range is a range. And there are always going to be people at either end, because it's a bell curve, who sit outside of that range. It can never encompass everyone. Then we test every two to three years. And all I would stress in this is that the most important thing is you. How do you feel? Do you feel well or unwell? And if you're unwell, go back, talk about it, have a trial of treatment. So how does a good GP approach it? So for me, the most important thing about this is that they don't sit looking at the blood tests. I get absolutely infuriated when colleagues do their thyroid checks looking at their computer screen. They don't even have the patient in. So they, they should see the patient they should see the patient in front of them as an individual who will be different from the last thyroid, thyroid patient that they saw. They do think, could it be something else? Because they should, of course they should. They try and exclude all other things that could be causing this. So for example, if I see a woman around menopausal age, I will try and either treat the thyroid first or the menopause first, but I will certainly try and address both, but never treat them at the same time because you'll never know which one you're actually making better. So always one thing at a time, never do treat two treatments at once. Find out what's going on in the patient's life. What's changed? Are they very, very stressed? As I said to you, so I became ill when I was very, very stressed. I had massive things going on. I started feeling unwell. My bloods were being done by my GP. My TSH was going up. My T4 was fine but my T3 was not, my T3 was below range. So they gave me more and more T4 and nothing changed. My T4 did not change, it went up, but my T3 didn't. My T3 stayed stubbornly below range. And in the end, I had an endocrinologist who say, said to me, you need some T3. And for me, having T3 at the time was a game changer. I actually felt well within a week. It completely changed things. So you need someone who's looking at you and your bloods and thinking outside of the box. They're talking to you and they're involving you in the discussion and the plan. Um, they're recognizing that the NICE guidelines are just that, guidelines. NICE guidelines are not the law, by the way. They're not an instruction to doctors. They are designed as a guideline based on evidence to help them make their decisions. That doesn't mean that they they can't move outside of those guidelines. And it really doesn't. And if a GP quotes the nice guidelines at you as a reason not to go outside of the box, then question them. And don't be scared to question doctors. They're humans, we're humans. We don't know everything. And we really don't know everything. Um, and ask for tests if you want them. Say, no, I'm not happy. I want a T4, I want a T3. You might struggle with the T3 because some labs, labs won't do it. Um, but certainly ask for it. And also you need a GP who is on alert for a patient who is hypothyroid or subclinically hypothyroid who's planning to get pregnant because in a patient planning to be pregnant, the TSH needs to be under 2.5 and there is not a fertility clinic in the land who would not get a patient's T TSH under 2.5. Even if that patient is not on treatment, they will start them on treatment. So that's really important. So hopefully I've answered some of these questions that I mentioned at the beginning of this. You know, why is my GP happy with my normal blood test? Well, I think I've answered that. Um, how can we be made more aware of thyroid disease? Okay, Renee, I've lost your sound. Can other people hear Renee? Thumbs up if you can hear Renee. Okay, just yes. me. Yes. Okay, Hello. thank you. So how can GPs be made more aware of thyroid issues? Well, that's where we need the likes of Lorraine and charities who are championing, you know, patients and going forward, talking to GPs, sending out information, speaking to the press, writing articles, getting on, you know, 
on TV, on radio, and obviously I try that too, to actually just get GPs up there and with the programme, as it were. We have very little training, and I think that's what patients don't realise. So we learn very little about thyroid when we're at medical school, and I can remember the thyroid lecture, and I can remember the lecturer saying, oh, it's really easy. If you have to take the thyroid away, you just give them thyroxine. Easy peasy, cheapest chips, done. And I can remember feeling absolutely insulted and infuriated in that, le in that lecture. But that was my thyroid education. What people don't realise is that once GPs leave their, their three-year training course um, of GP specialisation, they are then completely on their own. There is no mandatory training. Any training that we do, we have to pay for out of our own pocket. It's not funded for us. Um, and then a GP has to decide what it is that they want to train in. We have the same problem with menopause training. Um, so it's not always the GP's fault. And for some reason, thyroid might not be very sexy for them. And they might not decide to go on that course or pay for that course. And some of these courses cost about £400. They are expensive. And why is there such a long wait? Well, it's because there are long waits for everything now and there really are for absolutely everything from gynae through to thyroid and I hate to say it I have written recently about this in Pulse and the Daily Mail those waits are going to be longer now because we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to Covid and we're not seeing patients we're not referring patients and we're not treating patients so when this tunnel is over and we're at the other end I'm afraid those wait lists are going to be even longer and that makes me very sad and why is my whole system broken down well as I said at the very beginning your thyroid is your engine it controls everything we have receptors for T4 in every single cell in the body and that's why when it goes wrong all of those organs go wrong too so that's basically my presentation. I have no, no idea how long that took, Lorraine. Um, but it was hopefully... fabulous, <laughs> so thank you. Please, can you explain the role of cortisol in hypothyroidism? In hypothyroidism? Yeah. So I can't in a nutshell because mm. it's just too complex as I really touched on it earlier. But there, there's just feed, all, of hormone, all of these hormones actually um, are made from sex hormones all of our hormones are actually generated in the body some of them come from our adrenal glands some of them are made from our ovaries and then they're broken down and made into other hormones and it's a really really complex relationship but it definitely does affect our thyroid function in some people but as humans and this i think is really important you know it's all very well having a medical textbook but we're dealing with humans and humans are different every single one of us which is why some of us can take one drug and not another mm. some some t4 works some some it doesn't so everybody's cortisol will work differently but it is our stress hormone and what the body does when our cortisol several um levels are raised is it goes into action to shut down some other hormones so it reduces our available T4 and T3 to a degree um, because it puts us into fight or flight mode. So it almost focuses all its energy on us running away from the bear, as it were, that's about to eat us. Um, and in doing so, it shuts down the access that is that complicated feedback access. But I can't go into the, um, the detail of why it does it. What I am happy to do and I am happy to do this always, is do a little bit more research and try and put it into a more succinct answer about the physiology and feed that back. Yeah, that would be amazing. And, and actually, um, don't do yourself down because I think that was a really good explanation. Um, you know, I, I know um, we always say stress is really bad for thyroid patients. Um, and I know like if I, like after today, after you know, running this event, I know I will be shattered for the rest of today and I'll probably be shattered tomorrow. And I kind of know that that's because I'm running a bit on adrenaline doing this. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and I kind of know that that's a little bit my tendency in life. And I kind of have learned that that's not good for me and not very sensible. It's, you know, it's very, this is why we say in our ground rules, you know, we really have to have a calm environment because stress well, is such a bad thing for us. We know, we know that cortisol, running high cortisol all the time is not good for any of us. Yes. It, suppress, it suppresses our immune system as well. At mm. the same time, it makes us more susceptible to disease and catching mm. things. Mm. So cortisol is really important. 
Yeah, I think it's really pertinent. Um, Renee, do you have any advice on how to present one's case to a doctor or an endocrinologist to educate them but not antagonise them? Because I think a lot of thyroid patients find um, doctors can almost seem hostile um, and it's very sort of mystifying when you're sat there feeling unwell but you kind of think, well, are we doing something that's causing this sort of antagonised response that we sometimes get? So this is really interesting because I... I went on to the NICE Thyroid Guidance Committee because I wanted to change the guidance. I wanted to represent patients, actually. Um, I wanted to represent myself and get those guidelines changed. And what I found was, without mentioning names, obviously, is that it was a hostile environment. Mm. The, the endocrinologists in the room had very fixed ideas and they weren't going to change them. And... If I tell you that I was told that T3 was madness at work, in the room, and I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm a colleague, and I was talking about myself, and I was told it was madness, I know what you're up against. Mm -hmm. And I sat and I looked and I said, you know, I might, I would accept that in all disease, areas and I mean this there's a little bit of madness sometimes of course there is because you know that's the world we live in but my blood results were not being mad on their own outside of me outside of my belief system whether that was mad or not my blood tests were not being mad they were what they were and so even for me as a doctor it's very hard to tell you how to approach that I always say to patients, when they say to me, look, doctor, and they're almost apologetic, I looked on Google and I know I shouldn't do that. I always say, no, I'm really pleased you've done that because it means that I know what's worrying you and I know what there is for us to talk about. And I mean that sincerely. They might be wrong, they might be right, but at least then I know that when they've left the room, Everything that's in them, their mind that they're worried about is on the table and we've talked about it. And sometimes I learn stuff and that's really important as well. So all I would say is I just go in very carefully and say, look, I know this can be really hard sometimes, but I've done some research for myself because um, I've really, really struggled with this. And I hope you don't mind. And I know that sounds like you're kowtowing a little bit, but I think it's the only way to open up in what I know is already a very hostile environment. Mm. And that's all I'm trying to do, just to give you a way in. You know, I hope you don't mind, but I've done this and I was hoping today we could really talk about it. Mm. Mm. No, well, um, thank you for acknowledging that there is that issue. And um, I, I think um, this is something that we, we've had, we've had previous discussions, like before we even became the Thyroid Trust, we've, we've, we've had lots of discussions about how to get the most out of your doctor and um, I think maybe we should do some specific um, events on that topic. I, I, I used to say and I still feel that I think I had to use every ounce of my professional communication skills to get a sort of decent level of service from, from my doctors for my hypothyroidism and um, I think you know some sort of you know communications techniques and things that you can use like being humble and being cautious as you say. But yeah. sort of other, and really sometimes the other way of doing it of course is I don't know if people know that you can always book a double appointment with a GP and mm. a double appointment with me is half an hour and half an mm. hour is a good time but with many GPs it'll only be 20 minutes mm. or the other way to do it is to have your first appointment and already book a second one because we know it will be three weeks down the line mm. and in that first appointment set the scene so you know you hope they don't mind but you've been doing some research so what you want to do today was just share with them where you're coming from be that the nice guidelines what you've been thinking about t4 t3 and that you thought that you could just talk about the outline of where you're going and you have another appointment in three weeks to That's give them clever. time to have a look at it and you so by the time you get back in three weeks, you will have done a bit more research and they will have had time to think about what you've put in front of them. Yeah, that's really clever. That's a great suggestion. Fantastic. Um, another pre-submitted question. Um, this is interesting. So we talked a bit about sort of blood tests um, and the question here is, do you accept that some patients might need a dose of T3 that will actually put them above the accepted range for T3, at least for certain periods of the day? Um, and sort of related to that, do you accept that for patients who might be taking T3 on its own, um, that TSH might actually be lower than the accepted range? So it's a question about blood tests outside of the range. Okay, so 
Right. I have sat with the TSH below range for many, many years. It has caused many an argument with my GP, mm. but it was the only place that I was feeling okay. Mm. But I also feel that T3, when you take it, suppresses your TSH much more than taking T4 does. Mm. Now, I have recently, for the first time in 15 years, actually moved my TSH into normal range. Only just, it's 0.9, um, but it's in normal range. But it hasn't been there for a very, very long time. And the, the reason I did that is I started to get some arrhythmias. Mm. So I've actually taken my T3 down now quite dramatically. I'm hardly on any. But I'm going to give two answers to this. The first is that yes, as a GP, I will accept it, but I had to fight quite hard with my GP practice. So I don't treat myself. Um, I had to fight quite hard to get them to accept it. And what they did is without telling me, they wrote to an, um, a consultant endocrinologist and said, what do you think? And his letter reply was fantastic. And he's not, a, he's not an endocrinologist that I know lots of people love. And it is, I'll tell you who it is, it was Mark Vanderpump. Oh yes, we've had Mark Vanderpump at events. Okay. So, I think he's coming around more now to the T3. So I didn't know they'd written to him. And his reply was simply, why don't you get the patient in and have a look at her? And if she appears euthyroid, she's fine. If she doesn't, she isn't. Yeah. I subsequently saw Mark Vanderpump and all he said to me was, is as you get older, you will need to bring your TSH up because of the risk of atrial fibrillation. And he was right, but it actually happened naturally. Mm. I started to get some arrhythmias, so I, I started to bring my T TSH up. The other thing I'm gonna say in reply to that particular question is, I don't know what my T3 does during the day, and I never ever have a blood test done after I have taken thyroid hormone, be that T4 or T3. So when I have my blood test done on that day, I have them done in the morning and I do not take my dose of T4 or T3 until after I've had my blood done. Mm. And that's generally advice, isn't it? Is if you're having a blood test, take your medicine afterwards rather than, rather than just before. Yeah. Because you're going to get a serum plasma peak. So at that point, you may well be over the range. Mm. So just don't leave yourself open for that call from your GP surgery. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed a couple of questions that have come through from um, or comments through from Sharon and Judith about um, suppressed TSH and um, you know, how that's impacted through on um, maintaining weight and uh, other health issues. And they're asking for ideas about what they can do to try um, as um, the basically endocrinologists have, have not come up with any support. Is that a fair comment? Kind of Sharon and Judith. Are we allowed to be off mute <laughs> just to just to update? Um, yes, I mean we've we've both got got our TSH low, um, but obviously, if that's not good for us, if we've got to bring it up and then we feel rubbish. Um, I think the question from Judith was, you know, how do we do that ourselves safely, or, or if, if if we're not getting support. And also, I feel better with my TSH under 0.5, but still symptomatic um, in that I can't lose any weight at all. Tried everything. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. so this is a really, really tough one. And I completely feel it because as I said to you, I've had a very suppressed TSH for a long time. Um, so I think there are two answers to this really. So I think one has to consider whether or not maybe you need a T3 test done. You know, so you might have a very, very suppressed TSH, but what is your T3 doing? Because it could be that your T3 is just still sitting at the bottom in the doldrums and maybe you're not converting T4 to T3 because at the end of the day, you can have a massive amount of T4. It will suppress your TSH because that's the natural feedback. But if when it gets to your cells, you're not convert converting it, then it's not doing anything. It's just floating around, suppressing your TSH and doing nothing. So it might be worthwhile asking for T3 test and seeing where that is. And if that's very, very low, then the answer is to bring down your T4 gradually and put in a, put in a tiny bit of T3. But you're going to have to have an understanding doctor to do that. So I suggest the first test is the first step is a test. And even if you can't get that on the NHS, they're not very expensive at your local hospital. So if your GP says no, they can't do the test, ask them to write you a referral letter for the test at your local private 
blood take in hospital or clinic and they're usually about 28 pounds that's what they are in my area and obviously that will vary place to place and I know not everybody has 28 pounds so I'm not dismissing that but I'm just giving different solutions to get in one in terms of weight unfortunately if your t3 is fine and your t4 is fine and your tsh is suppressed then it's not your thyroid generally that's making that difficult it's just your metabolism sadly and everybody's metabolism is different obviously and there are so many approaches to weight loss that it's difficult to know where to guide you um i always guide patients if i can towards no carbs um smaller portion sizes um i don't even talk about exercise because exercise is a very small amount in weight management it is about you know food input and i don't mean that in calories i just mean that in the type of food and finding out what your body wants and generally low carbs will work for most people but again not all because everybody's different but low carbs and i mean i'm a low carb fanatic so that's how i know it works for me um and it's hard it probably takes about three months before your brain will accept that as a solution because it's a whole lifestyle change i mean i don't buy anything my house is ridiculous it really is it, and it, it, you wouldn't know i had a child in it because i buy nothing because i have zero willpower it might look like i don't have zero but i have zero willpower so if there is a packet of biscuits in my cupboard i will eat every single one in one sitting without a shadow of a doubt so i don't buy them they're not in the house if you want a snack here now all you can have is a tin of sardines <laughs> believe me so it's really really hard so i think start with the bloods because i'm not saying it's just your metabolism start with blood see if you can get a t3 and then go from there there's um another question that's come in from um i, I think you probably answered some of this but it was i think it's olivia i'd noticed about is there any um foods or a kind of certain diet that we should follow um particularly if you've had hashimoto's confirmed Yes. So the answer to this obviously depends on what your situation is. So for me, no, I don't have a thyroid. So any amount of food, and it took me quite a few years to convince my mother to stop sending me articles about how to make my thyroid work better. Because if you don't have one, nothing's going to work. But there's lots of different research. It's not what NICE would call high evidence research, but it's there. So gluten-free diets for some people do seem to work because if you've got an autoimmune thyroid disease, you are six times more likely to get celiac disease. So trying a gluten-free diet for two to three weeks and see if it improves symptoms um, might help. And obviously have a blood test to rule out celiac disease. And this is where your GP comes in to make sure that there's not other things going on. Mindfulness, um, relaxation meditation to relieve stress and obviously keep that cortisol down selenium is actually very important for synthesizing hormone and thyroid hormone and some studies have shown that um, increasing your selenium can reduce your antibody level so that's worth considering as a supplement or eating foods rich in selenium like brazil nuts meats fish seeds wholemeal bread um, iron is really important so red meat if you eat meat and i realize lots of people don't poultry fish beans pulses but certainly iron um rich foods be careful with supplements because supplements are hard to take can cause constipation or diarrhea so i would be careful with supplements but certainly try and increase iron rich foods into your diet and then goitrogenic foods like cabbage kale broccoli cauliflower can actually interfere with thyroid function believe it or not so it sounds really healthy but if you eat large amounts of those foods especially if they're raw so um, because cooking them reduces their goitrogenic effects um, but if you eat them raw it can actually suppress your thyroid function um, and then vitamin d and i'm going to give you another reason to take vitamin d because we think that vitamin d is playing a massive role in worse outcomes in covid so i take 4000 international units of vitamin d a day which we know is a non-toxic dose and i had my vitamin d levels tested this week to see and they were still only 91 now what 91 is optimal but considering i'm taking 4000 units a day and i eat a really high vitamin d diet because i eat loads of oily fish sardines in the cupboard um you know, it's still not massively high because it can go up to 250. So those are my tips for food. I hope that helps. That's fantastic. I was going to say something else. Well, thank you so much. Another round of applause. Pleasure. No, thank um, you. Well, thank you enough, Renee. Pleasure. And, um, 
let's all keep in touch and continue to be determined to make things better for thyroid patients even during the pandemic which does make it more difficult to get attention um, for a condition which is uh, not as well understood not as well not sexy yeah but we know that there's around two million people in the uk with hypothyroidism and we think perhaps 10 percent of those people um, are perhaps not as well treated as they should be so it's a really 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 big issue um, and we're absolutely determined to continue to address it and address it more robustly as we as we grow and develop our capacity to do so so thank you very much everybody for coming um let's keep in touch since i knew the beginning there's, so there's one other thing to say outside of covid measures because at the moment it's been different in covid on the first tuesday of every month at 2 30 i have a phone in with joanne good on bbc radio london which everyone can get online so if you have any burning questions you can always phone up and ask me there because we do get thyroid questions and you can phone in and ask and that's bbc radio london bbc radio london the first tuesday of every month at 2 30. of late we've only been addressing covid but that will go back to normal soon i hope <laughs>